Okay, it's 7 o'clock, and I will call the March 25th, 2013 meeting to order. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Mrs. Treadway, if you do the roll call, please. Here. 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 Okay, with seven of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. We do have one item to remove, item 8.6. Are there any other changes to the agenda at this time? Seeing none, then I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda with the removal of item 8.6. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. Okay, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, <laughs> nay. Motion carries. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time period per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. Bailey Darling, B-A-Y-L-E-E, D-A-R-L-I-N-G, W7850 Country. Okay, my name is Bailey Darling, and I'm a senior at Homeland High School, and last time I was here, I was in sixth grade, and I talked to, I don't know how many are like still here, but I talked to the board about opening up the co-op for the girls' hockey team with Alaska and the other schools that are there, and I'm here today just to thank you guys for doing that, and we went to state this year, and we got second for the second year in a row. And I'm proud to say that I was part of that and I could be a leader on the team and represent women. And I hope that it can continue and I hope that you guys do continue the co-op because I am proud to say that I'm the first home and girl hockey player to play college and I know that there's many behind me that will be coming up. So I would just like to say thank you guys for approving that. Well, Bailey, where are you going to college? Um, Concordia University. It's in Mequon. And will you be playing hockey there, will you? Yep. Good. Oh, you did say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. And so um, I have been seeing, I'm a Facebook friend of your mother's, and so I have <laughs> been seeing, and it's been fun to, yeah. to follow you. And I know they call it the Onalaska Co op, and I just go, ah! Yeah, it's, it's hard to wear my purple. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> we feel your pain because we, we hardly ever wear purple here either. So, <laughs> but, um, yeah. so it's been a great experience. Yeah, very great. And how many others are following you? You said others are following behind well, you. Well, when I started, we actually had only two girls from Holman on the, scene, on the team. And this year we had five, which was the most out of any other co-op. So that was, it's good to watch it grow. And I know I'm the only one leaving this year and there's two coming up. So it's continuing to grow and there's a lot of talent on the team. So I'm sure there's gonna be other college girls from Holman going too. That's wonderful. Board members, any other questions about the co-op for her? I remember approving the co-op. So <laughs> I remember you. when you were little and you came. You're welcome. Thank you for coming <laughs> forward. And you should be recognized as a, uh, taking second place. That's great and wonderful. Thank you for representing us so well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to come forward and address the board this evening? Hello, my name is uh, John Becker. I live at W7724 Trace Court here in Holman. Um, I've been in the school district, I, I guess, for about 27 years. Um, this is my neighbor, Doug, you can introduce. Yep, Doug Wesley, W7727 Trace Court. Uh, the reason that we came this evening is, uh, you know, I've certainly all 27 years in the community been a 
Athletic supporter, a coach, a number of different sports, um, typically about three sports a year for the last seven or eight years, get a chance to work with a, a number of the youth coming up. So obviously, I think sports is uh, extremely important. Um, 34 years ago, approximately, I had the opportunity to play in the state basketball championship uh, down at the old field house uh, with our neighboring Melrose Mindoro. Since that time, uh, I've had the opportunity, we didn't win, we finished second. <laughs> But uh, um, talk about an experience with a community that galvanizes the community, brings people together, um, is just a feel good type of thing. I went home for a funeral last weekend and people are still taught, you know, you, you sit down for lunch afterwards and 34 <laughs> years later, that still comes up. The reason I, I, I kind of set that out there a little bit is because again, being the time of the year it is, I'm just, I just think that there's nothing um, is exciting, I think, to a community than, than the state basketball tournament and, and the participation that you actually go through with the tournament structure itself. As you probably all know, and I don't have the exact dates, but approximately five years ago, the WIAA changed um, some of the rules and some of the formatting and the seating that goes on with, with, with the tournaments. Um, and, and of course, the last three and it may go farther than that, but the last three years, we've been lucky enough to have, whether it's our boys teams or girls teams, uh, host a regional tournament or, or a sub-regional, whatever it happens to be. And as many of you probably know, um, there's been a conflict with that, with, with, with the facilities. Um, it's the same week as the, the show choir event here that, that we hold in the community, which um, I did have a chance last week to meet with Mr. Englerth and, and of course uh, told me of all the challenges and stuff that goes in with the scheduling that goes in with all these different things. Um, but I think one of the things that, that we feel strongly and adamantly about is that 52 weeks out of the year um, are open to have some type of event. There's two, two weekends during the year that are set aside for regionals, which could be the only tournament dates that, that, that ultimately would get to, uh, where you would host a home regional. And I think it's just a shame that, that, that again, that we have to, um, and especially give up that home court advantage um, that, that, that the teams have, have earned. Um, and, and to kind of talk a little bit about the home court advantage, because I think it does um, maybe need a little bit of explaining. Um, I, I don't mean just, just the fact that um, the other facility that we have in a lot of cases this year, there, there was plenty of room to put enough people in there. That, that's probably not really the issue, but I think anybody that's ever maybe coached or played basketball before understand that's a little bit different than a football field. It's a little bit different than the, uh, maybe a wrestling mat, meaning that with the shooting and so on and so forth, with the lighting and the practicing there 90 some nights and 15 home games, there gets to be a little bit of a home court advantage. And I, I, I studied that a little bit further. I went out and, and did some reading on people that have done tests on this before. The, the test that they came back with says that the, that the visiting teams, when you go on the road, you shoot 8% less, which maybe don't seem like a big thing, um, but equates to three points a ball game, which again, maybe don't mean a great big thing, but I think anybody that's a basketball fan watched ball games this last weekend, probably saw a couple games that came down with that three points, meant quite a bit. So I, I think that again, um, you know, some of the things that we would like to see is it, what kind of options can be. We feel if this doesn't get brought to the attention here that it'll already get scheduled and not next year and then the next year, then the next year. We would like to see some alternatives explored to um, what are the other options out there that, that can be hosted. Now again, I, I understand how important it is for the show choir as well, but I also think that basketball is played in the, within a gymnasium and uh, I think the expectations to, to, to play their home games are now, for a lot of seniors, their last home game on their home court um, is extremely important. Some of the suggestions that were made were, were again, uh, is, is there an alternative facility? Could they flip-flop dates with, with Central or another, team or another show choir within the, the community? Um, so we certainly talked about some of those with Mr. Engler, but... Um, yeah, I think the home court advantage is, is quite a thing uh, for these players. The girls this year are a great senior group. I think they had a lot of, a lot of promise. 
Did that court make a difference? Sure it did. The, the crowd, the environment, everything's different. The students are in a different spot. Um, it's just not the same when you play all your home games. Um, some people think it's all right. Well, they have a gym to play in. Well, it, it's not all right, I don't think, to the players, some of the parents involved, and, and the coaches. Uh, and, and people have played sports and, and about home court, it's just not right that you lose your gymnasium where you've played all those games in high school and then you have to go play one of the biggest playoff games and, and, and next year it could be, you know, are we going to have a top seed? I think the boys and the girls have gotten so much better, we're going to see more and more of that. And like he said, the dates changed about five years ago because the regional finals never were a home court advantage. But now that it is, we'd like to see the, the boys and girls have that advantage to do that. And, and like say, if you have an Onalaska uh, Central boys game in the middle school, it's, it's going to be a big ticket item, you know, when you get to that Friday, Saturday night, you know, in the future. So just wanted to bring those awareness, awareness to the board itself. And lastly, I just wanted to add, as I guess, as, a, as a, you know, as a coach and a parent, first and foremost, maybe the emotional side comes out, but as a taxpayer in the community, to be quite frank with you, I, I'm a little bit almost embarrassed when other schools have to come down and play a regional final over at a grade school. Um, one that doesn't even, they have no showers. From my knowledge, I've been told they have no shower room over there, or functional showers. If I'm a team coming down from River Falls, now again, I, kids are a little bit different maybe, but back in 1979 when I went to school, I've heard that they don't shower all the time anymore or whatever it happens to be, but I'd like to at least have the option if I gotta jump back on a bus for two and a half hours and drive home. Well, thank you. Um, Dr. Carlson will respond on behalf of administration um, as, as our practice, because it's not an issue on our agenda. We really um, don't discuss those kind of things at this point in time, but thank you for coming before the board. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? <coughs> If I remember correctly, I'm supposed to give my name and address. Name That's and address, correct. please, uh, Lynn yes. Lynn Henderson, uh, 202 Long Cooley Road, just across from the middle school. So, um, I guess I'd like to take my time to make a, a small rebuttal to the previous comments. Um, I'm a father of a student that's part of the show choir. Uh, this is her second year, Haley Henderson. I don't know if any of you know her or not. Um, <clears throat> this has been a very important part of her life for the last two years. Uh, it's a very important part of, of our entire family and a lot of families' lives. A lot of these students don't have any other opportunity outside of the arts to participate in a team environment. Um, this is very much a team. There was about 40 students that were part of the dance troupe, plus another 15 students that were part of the band, plus another five or six that are part of the, the uh, stage crew. Very important activity for them. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else is aware of how much effort they put into this. They start in August, learning their choreography, learning their music. They practice the entire year. Their season does not start until January. Their season ends in the middle of March. Now, we don't have any other activities on campus that are that length of time. Football, maybe. Uh, they may start earlier in the summer, but this is a very long activity, a lot of hours that these kids put in. It's an extracurricular activity outside of the normal school day. Um, it's a large expense for the families because we don't get to host <laughs> games at our own school. We travel for every event that we go to. Um, it's not a, an activity that is in any way, to my knowledge, paid for through funds from the administration or from the, from the, uh, the school district. We have a parents organization that we raise all of our funds. Our largest event, our biggest fundraiser for the entire year is this one event. Now, we are in no way trying to uh, diminish the fact that, uh, you know, the basketball team, we're not trying to get in the way, we're not trying to fight, um, but we have one event per year that raises the majority of our funds. It's over $20,000 is what we raised in one day. Um, as far as using other facilities within the, within the, uh, the school district um, on the same weekend, it's not possible. 
we have schools, we had 15 schools this year that came in, all of their buses, all of the parents that came in, uh, all of the other people from the community that do enjoy coming to show choir competitions <coughs> need to have parking. We don't have parking enough to do it. Um, we don't have the ability to get into the gyms to be able to set those up. We have over $10,000 worth of equipment that's already set up, that's been paid for, that's in this gym, that gets hung up when the event is over, and then used the following year. If we tried to change venues, we'd have to expense that out again at a separate place. Um, again, I, I fully support the basketball team. I played myself in high school. Um, I understand that uh, home court advantage, knowing the floor, knowing the, the, um, the rims, the backboards, all that other stuff important. But a big part of that is just being able to play and sleep in your own bed, not have to travel on a bus for two or three hours <laughs> to get somewhere. Um, again, I just wanted to, I guess, raise attention that this is also something that other parents, other, other children, is very important to them. Um, I know that uh, the activities director has talked with Troy Larson, who's the, the show choir director, and, and we have explained to them, you know, these are the, the, the weeks that all of these different schools have. Uh, they've been laid out for, from my understanding, 15 years is when they, they go back to when each school was assigned a week that they can have their event. We have looked at other opportunities to change to other weekends. It's just not there. Um, so anyway, I, I just wanted to say that there are other people in the community um, that really want to, to <coughs> see the arts and see this, uh, the show choir kids have a chance to continue uh, performing for the community. So. Well, again, thank you for coming um, and presenting to the board. As I indicated, Dr. Carlson will respond to you. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board this evening relative to any item? Okay, seeing no one, then we'll move on to reports and discussion. Maintenance Department Building and Grounds Report, Mr. Daly. Good evening, everybody. Um, tonight, I'm going to uh, focus my report on, on one of our result, result measures we use and then how it relates to some of the work we've been doing on the Buildings and Grounds Committee. Um, one of the result measures we do is, is an operational cost of, of uh, or maintenance and operational cost per square foot. You'll see this in the annual report, this measure. Um, counts labor, utilities, supplies, projects, those kinds of things. And it compares us to the um, other Mississippi Valley public schools. You've seen this one. This is an updated uh, um, graph showing where our expenditures are per square foot compared to the MVC average. The MVC average is in the pink. This is our cost per square foot. Uh, I don't have the K. 12 state average, um, but you can see here we follow along pretty close to um, the MVC. Only we do we do do it for less. Uh, our cost right now is about four hundred and excuse me four dollars and seventy five cents a foot compared to the MVC average of six oh three. That was in eleven and twelve. Um, the method of calculating this cost is, is just taking in an all-exclusive annual operating and maintenance costs through the general fund and community service funds. Um, we do this uh, with each district and divide it by the total number of square feet that, that each school has uses for occupied spaces. And when I say occupied spaces, it's spaces that are heated and cooled and cleaned uh, on a regular basis. We don't include 40 fund, which are referendum dollars or construction funds. We don't include that, those expenditures for operations or maintenance uh, in, this, in this report. Um, 
the, those forty those uh, referendum funds would would really move this line up and down quite a bit and and really what we want to focus on is a general fund here and community funds our district target is is just rank favorably with the neighboring school districts and by favorably favorably I mean we would like to be at or below the MVC average um, in fact our, our uh, our target is to try to be about 10% lower. Um, one of my goals this year has also been trying to break down that cost within the buildings and grounds department per square foot, uh, not just overall, but in categories. You, you know, uh, we worked really hard with uh, utilities. Uh, we know we rank favorably there. As, as I looked at the as I looked at the data, I've got some of that stuff. I, I don't have it on this report. Our labor costs are ranked very well also. Um, some of the variables we look at are the cleaning levels. Um, I think all our school districts in the area are very similar, although we do get some nice comments about how our buildings look. Um, the standard of, of cleaning that we've, we expect has been our standard for over 20 years now. Community use of buildings can, can be a variable. The cost of utilities can be affected by things as heating degree days and cooling degree days. We're going to have a lot more heating this year than we did last year. Um, seasonal issues such as uh, snow removal could affect operational costs as well, as well as uh, age of the buildings and uh, capital improvements. I'm going to change a little bit of direction here, but this is a graph, and, and what it represents is related to our cost per square foot. You've seen something similar to this. I've, I've presented something similar to this before. This is what we've been working on in the Buildings and Grounds uh, um, Committee, Building Grounds Facility Committee. The bars to the left is actually represent some history for us. Um, the green here is, is, is general fund dollars that were spent on capital improvements. Um, the purple ones here, here and here, are, are capital improvements that were actually um, spent from, um, from uh, sinking fund dollars, dollars that we put away uh, through earlier referendums, for instance, at Sand Lake and the high school, the high school edition. Um, the blue represents 40 funds, and as I said, that's not reported in that graph you saw earlier. But it does tell us a, a little bit about what we've done, and I've talked about this in the past as well. As far as, as, far as our strategy here at Holman um, to, to fund capital needs has been through referendums, and this has worked fairly well. The strategies work very well um, as we were... Um, growing and needing to build and have a referendum every four or five years that strategy worked out well we we, we piggybacked some some maintenance needs onto those referendums and, and that's how we got, were able to uh, support the capital needs of this district throughout those years uh, without having to put a lot of dollars into the general fund but as as growth has slowed and and our mm -hmm need to have a, a building referendums have have decreased i think our next building ref our next building right now is, is is scheduled for the middle school like in 2018 and that has moved out from earlier years because our growth has been slowing um the numbers on the left or excuse me the numbers on the right and the graph or the graph on the right um shows our projected needs and costs and what is funded and what is unfunded again the green is what is funded through our regular budget the purple is what's funded through through the uh, sinking funds and the red represents unfunded needs um, those 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 capital improvements that are needed are, you know are um, you know it's HVAC equipment it's it's uh, track maintenance it's parking lot maintenance. There's, there's a there's a whole list of items that are that are included there and that represents those those red bars over the next seven years represents about two million dollars of proposed needs improvements or enhancements not very many enhancements mostly 
needs and improvements. Um, this has really been the focus on the buildings and grounds committee this year. Um, what we've done is, is, is reviewed this document and then and, 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 uh, looked at all these projects listed for the next seven years. We've developed the waiting rubrics to wait um, which projects will, will get funded first. I, we've shared this with the board um, and you've seen similar waiting rubrics presented to you before. Um, the next step for us has been to try to find uh, is to look for funding solutions so so we've got these needs so what are we going to be able to do about it uh, so far we've, we've developed 16 possible funding solutions they range from leasing to reallocation of funds to in the general budget to referendums to revenue exemptions to user fees to selling district property um, and we're in the middle of evaluating these options right now. And we've developed a matrix that asks such thing as, as sustainability, flexibility, effective use of, uh, of the resources, taxpayer impact. And this is, where the, this is the point of where the committee's at now. This slide is actually the same slide I showed you earlier, except um, this one adds a line in the middle and that line in the middle represents <coughs> what would happen to our comparison to the MVC schools if we added $250,000 a year for capital improvements to this budget. And you can see we'd still be well below the, the MVC average. We'd be still under 10% um, over, the, over the last, uh, over, over all of these reporting years. Um, two hundred fifty thousand dollars is what I believe annually would be a sustainable number for capital improvements in the school district of Holman. Um, so the buildings and grounds committee will, in the next couple of months, continue to study these needs and solutions to fund capital improvements. We'll complete our evaluation of the funding options and make a recommendation to the board on how to fund capital in, uh, improvements in the future. So does anybody have any questions at this time that I may be able to answer? Any questions? Okay, I had a question sure. about the unfunded. If you go back to that where you showed the red, and, the, and it keeps flipping on my iPad, so could, okay. if that could come up. Oh, where the, the uh, yeah, you had the, like, I think it was 2013, 14, Oh, where it had the bar graph. The bar graph, yes. Uh, don't know how, there we go. There. So two, you've got that unfunded costs in 13, 14 right. that just, I don't know how much is that, 600,000 maybe in unfunded of that. And then the next year, right. there's a smaller amount. So my question is just, is that assuming that that unfunded cost was somehow then met and no actually that would just transfer over to the next bar if, if those were not met then that the next bar in 1415 would be much much higher so then that, in 14, this, this would assume that they'd be met somehow okay and then that's what this and then 1415 would be this much would be new or right. possibly what right. was not met okay I just wanted Correct. to clarify because I'm like oh well that doesn't add up yeah. but, all right I'm glad to care, clarify that any other questions? Thank you, John. <clears throat> and then it is my, I don't know if we should even call on him. <laughs> Mr. Saxton, I think if you looked at the personnel report later, you'll see why, but Mr. Saxton, transportation Hi. report. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. I bet it is. Say a, couple, <laughs> say a couple words about transportation and try to keep the comments from the side down. <laughs> oh, yeah. Here we go. How come this looks different than it always does on my computer? <laughs> For the audience, so this is why I'm leaving. Yeah, on our personnel report, it personnel announced his retirement. Nice. So. Nay. <laughs> And he looks really lighthearted, so yes. I have to give him a hard time. I remember hiring. Yep, there you we go. I do. I do. This is why I'm leaving. It's it's this. It's just become Technology. such a barrier to my. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> but it, on behalf of the school district, I need to exit. <laughs> so uh, it is my pleasure to be here tonight to uh, share some information about transportation. Uh, this is the vision and mission for support services. Transportation services attempts to fulfill the various components of that vision and mission. And as John had noted earlier, for his department, we have some uh, measures also in transportation. You remember this one from last fall. Uh, this one has not been updated because we haven't completed the school year. This is about safety. It's the accidents per 100,000 miles. Uh, you'll notice that we made considerable improvement last year. And so far, cross my fingers, uh, it's our goal this year to maintain that improvement as we finish this school year. And so far, we're on track to do that. Uh, percentage ridership, there is a lot of difference between uh, the schools in the MVC that provide transportation, La Crosse, Onalaska, Sparta, Toma. Uh, historically, Holman, which is the dark blue line, has had a substantial larger ridership than those communities. <clears throat> what I'm going to focus on tonight is the pupil transportation cost per mile. Uh, the red or pink line is the MVC average cost per pupil mile. The blue line is the Holman cost per pupil mile. As you'll note, uh, Holman has a lower number. This is like golf, where it's good to have a lower number. As I talk a little bit about the cost per pupil mile, I want to focus on how this measure is developed. These are the costs that go into the cost per pupil mile. The direction of pupil transportation, that's my position. Uh, the cost for bringing students to and from school, shuttle service, co-curricular activities, special education, insurance. All of the things that you would expect to see uh, for normal cost for transportation. Field trips, vehicle acquisition, which is bus purchase, vehicle repair, servicing, parent contracts. And there is another area down there that we aren't involved in. It mainly affects the eastern side of the state. All of these costs can be found in the DPI fiscal reporting. And uh, one person asked me, why do we include field trips and co-curricular in this? And because what we found out is that in some school districts, uh, they'll increase the cost on the to and from school to make their co-curricular costs very low. Others will experience the opposite. Their co-curricular costs uh, will be higher and their to and from school will be lower. So our solution on this is to bring in all the costs that are coded to transportation. The pupil count that is used in this is also so. Beyond. <laughs> okay, going on from there. <laughs> Yes, well, no. The, pupil, uh, the pupils that go into that are also based on DPI. Uh, at the beginning of the school year, if you were out at the school site, you'd see the bus drivers uh, out there with individual uh, lists of students. That serves multiple purposes. It helps the bus drivers learn the names of the kids that they're going to be transporting that year. But it also enables us to begin our actual count of students. DPI requires that the bus drivers sign off that students have actually ridden. So it doesn't matter whether or not you're eligible for a ride, we only count you after you have actually ridden a school vehicle. We go back to the bus drivers about four times a year uh, to verify those lists and they take it seriously because they understand uh, that's one way we can increase funding in transportation is to verify the students that ride our different vehicles. So even at this time of year, while we're be between sports seasons, we will have some students that show up for the first time. They haven't ridden yet this year. And so a driver very proudly comes in to announce that they have a new rider and they sign off for that student because they know it brings some funding uh, to our school district. The school year riders are all based on different categories uh, based on mileage. It goes zero to two miles, two to five miles, five to eight, eight to 12, 12 to 15, 15 to 18, and above. We take 
every student and identify which one of those categories that they live in. It's their one-way distance to school. And we take the average. If it was zero to two, which is the simplest one, it would be one mile, would be the average mileage for that student. So each student gets a mileage, uh, and then we have the mileage to school and the mileage home. So that student that I just talked about would actually come up with two pupil miles, once to school and once home. We do the same thing for private school riders, also summer school riders. The one group that we have to estimate is special education. Uh, that's counted in a different area, so it's not available to us in transportation. If you go to the Taxpayers Alliance, you can come up with a number of percentage of students that are special education and we use that number to estimate the number of special education students that are in transportation oh. thank you Jay you're gonna yeah. Jay I've always wondered what you did in administration and you're gonna be very valuable <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jay's poor Jay he's trying to <laughs> Jay let's just advance down to Distance, okay, distance and miles. And uh, I've already talked about that. School days. Again, if you go to DPI, you can look up each school in the state of Wisconsin. And we use the actual face-to-face -face days, not the workshop days, not the conference days, but the actual face-to-face -face days. And that's how we come up with the number of days uh, for this measure. We do that for the school year, and we do it for summer school. Summer school is obviously weighted because the number of days is much less. This brings us back to the pupil transportation cost per pupil mile. Again, similar to what John was talking about, I've added a third line to the measure. The measure in this case, the broken uh, dotted line in the middle, is 10% below the MVC average. But there's more that I want to point out to you on this graph. If you look from 2005 to 2009 at the blue line, which is Holman, you'll notice that nice gradual upswing. Nothing jumped around. During that time period, the school district purchased 12 buses, 2005 to 2009. At the same time we were purchasing those buses, the space between the blue line and the pink line were dollars that were not used in transportation that were made available for other programs because we were had a lower cost than the other average MVC schools. Those are dollars not used for transportation, which makes dollars available for students. If you go to 2010, when the economic downturn was taking its full impact in the school district, you'll notice that our costs went down. That's primarily due to not purchasing vehicles. And then obviously when you look at 2011-12, which has been updated, you'll notice that we're starting, our line is going up. Now costs are going up for all school districts. Fuel costs, repair costs, but when your fleet begins to age, your body repair costs start to go up dramatically. Plus, you're faced with less reliable service, and the quality of the service that you can provide begins to deteriorate. So you've got two things happening. And one, your costs are going up. Your ability to provide quality service begins to go down. And that's the stage where we are right now. As John noted on his chart, the same number applies to transportation. Jay, if I can ask you to go back. Thank you. Between the costs that we currently have, we could add $250,000 to transportation, and we would still be below the broken line, which is 10% below the other MVC average costs. I believe we're at a turning point in transportation. We need to maintain our fleet. And what I'm here to talk to you about tonight 
is that we need to get a plan out there for funding transportation. It's good that we have two buses coming in this year. It's good that Dr. Carlson has included some funding for transportation in the next budget year. But we need to increase that in a similar fashion to maintain it over the long term. The efficiency in transportation, if you remember the graph where it was nice and smooth, that's when you're maintaining your fleet. And it produces the most cost savings and the highest quality over the longest term. And that's where we want to get back to. We want to get away from short term uh, situations and get into long term predictable savings and high quality. Go ahead. Uh, if we do this, uh, I think you'll find that the transportation program in Holman can continue for a long time and be a productive and cost effective resource for the school district. And it really is something that we need to get after and not allow it to, to go away on us. Thank you. Any questions? I sense a theme of 250,000 tonight. Well, I don't know where John got that number, but he came <laughs> over to see me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much. And you know it is just in jest that we give you a hard time. I know that. We <laughs> It will be difficult to accept that later. Wait till I come back and get into the public part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, business services report. Quarterly budget adjustments. Mr. Austin. Another tough act to follow with all that comedic <laughs> language there. I would like to congratulate Roger on the, the big uh, Retirement, I think you'll find it hard to find someone more dedicated than Roger. He's been a fantastic guy to work with and learn from over uh, my tenure here with the district. And I just can't say enough about um, the experience I've had with him. So we've worked closely on many projects, and uh, whether it's Medicaid or um, people transportation product projects, it's, been, it's always been a pleasure working with Roger. So. Okay, so third quarter budget adjustments. Lots of information tonight, but we'll keep it as brief as possible and provide some room at the end for questions. Okay, so tonight, uh, the third quarter budget adjustments. This is the second budget adjustments that we've presented to the board. Remember, we approved the original budget in October. We revise it. In the second quarter, which is December, we'll make some minor revisions at that point in time. Now in March, we've got a lot more information available, um, final carryover balances for some of the title programs, um, updates in open enrollment information. All these things are necessary to provide some revisions in the budget at this point in time. So uh, right now, the third quarter revisions include revenue changes from some categorical aids you know, the final transportation aid, um, common school funds aid is released, and then also bilingual bicultural aid. In addition to our title programs and the carryover balances from last year are finalized by DPI. So that is all included in this budget at this point in time, in addition to that open enrollment. I also want to mention the WRS unfunded liability. Remember, that was information that I presented to you in January, and I said, hey, if, if we use fund balance and make this advance payment to pay this down, we can save a lot of interest for the district by doing that. So by advance funding, using approximately $180,000 worth of fund balance and paying that off in future years, we could save over $25,000 worth of interest. That is now being reflected in this budget revision as well, and I'll show you where that's at. So kind of lots going on. but for the most part at a smaller scale, but I'll go through some of that information. Uh, I would like to mention I was at a federal funding conference. I thought this was rather interesting recently down at, um, in Wisconsin Dells, and there was auditors there and many representatives from school districts. There was business managers, superintendents, um, title program coordinators, uh, idea flow through program coordinators, all these people in these rooms, and, and they were talking 
somehow budget revisions came up and they did a, a survey by a show of hands how many districts do budget revisions throughout the year and you would have been amazed you looked around the room and almost nobody raised their hand because most districts aren't doing revisions throughout the year they wait until June and they actually said that that will become one of those things that the auditors present and, and come in and, and share with the board uh, and possibly create a finding for some districts because they're not revising their budget throughout the year because the line item e expenditures by state statute you cannot overspend or you're not supposed to overspend those, those line items if you're not revising that throughout the year you're actually out of compliance with state statutes so it's pretty important to revise throughout the year and I think as a district we've made an effort to continually do that and I think we're ahead of the curve a lot of the districts were shaking their heads saying yeah we got to get better about doing that even though they know there's a time commitment in doing that so okay so the revised budget summary I'm gonna start off in a little bit different direction tonight and the reason for that is because the fund balance um, I want to start off with that and then get into more of the line item detail with the fund balance right now you've seen this diagram before, or this information in the past this layout and over in the left hand column you see the beginning fund balance which is line four right here to the ending fund balance and what goes into that so in line column I here we have the proposed budget and I like this because it lays it out where we were at in the fall during the proposed budget period to column J where the original budget was at and approved in October to column K where we did the revised budget in December some minor changes there to last but not least in the final column here the revised budget in March the beginning balance stays the same in each and every column this line here you notice stays the same we're not changing the beginning fund balance because that's what we ended up with last year however notice the operational surplus or deficit changes and that emphasizes the fluid nature of the budget throughout the year but right now we're anticipating an operational deficit and there's two reasons for that we had a reduction in the budget plan for that data manager position remember that we put on the list of wants in last fall well that position was never approved it wasn't filled so we're taking that out of the budget at this point in time however we've got new open enrollment related expenditures that are driving our expenditures up the combination of those two factors then increase our operational deficit at this point in time then remember that WRS unfunded liability that I mentioned earlier in my beginning comments that shows up here that was a planned approved expenditure with that then it has gone changed our structural surplus now to a structural deficit but it's a planned thing we're using one hundred eighty thousand dollars of fund balance to pay that off and reduce our interest owed by the district so the combination of those two things then is going to decrease our fund balance by two hundred and twenty one thousand dollars and I will caution everybody that's based on a full realization of all expenditures in the budget so building budgets are going to spend down every dollar they have allocated to them remember those one-time allocations that were presented to the board and approved in the fall for technology for curriculum for common core training and, and staff development initiatives this is based on every one of those expenditures being fully realized as of June 30th so if some of those projects don't uh, fully realize if they um, let's say the purchases aren't made fully by June but maybe some of them are picked up in July and fit completed in July some of those will be under realized making this structural deficit and operational deficit actually disappear more and possibly result in a balanced budget so that 220,000 could um, disappear real quick if those expenditure budgets aren't fully realized 
Any questions on fund balance at this point? Okay. Any questions? No. I'll briefly mention here, this is the DPI uh, revised budget summary format. Again, the reduction in the fund balance shows up here on the top of that. So right now, going from about a $9.28 million budget or fund balance in December down to nine point, uh, a little less than $9.1 million. On the revenue side, we've got very, very minor changes on the revenue side except for on lines 41 and 42. These are the carryover balances for <coughs> Title I and Title II and Title III. So there was a lot of talk about sequestration of funds. Um, last year we underspent in those categories. So we're allowed to carry them into this year. We carry those revenues into this year, but we also have you know, ex planned expenditures for most of those as well. So it doesn't provide a lot of relief to the budget at this point in time, but um, new you know, staff development initiatives and resources and stuff that we can put into classrooms immediately. Total resulting general fund increase in revenue about 52,000. Some due to categorical aids in addition to the Title I and uh, carryover funds. On the expenditure side, which is shown in this category here, lines 58 through 81, there's some uh, small reductions, 21,000, 12,000 in some of the various line items there. Remember that WRS, unfunded liability, DPI standards requires us, if we're paying that off in full, we have to account for that in fund, in function 290,000. I budget each one of those expenditures in all the, fun, uh, the functions up above under where we charge these salaries and benefits for staff in undifferentiated curriculum, regular curriculum. I budget for each of those in those categories. DPI requires us to take all that out in those categories, therefore reducing those line items and charging it all to line 71. So it's just a shifting of how I budget for that, reducing those line items 59 through 73, but increasing line 74. Just a, a shift in that. Line 71 is that data manager position, reducing that because it's unfilled at this point in time. So all in all, uh, oh, in, a, in addition to that, line 77 are open enrollment costs of more students going out. Uh, some of the changes in Act 10 and some of the changes that Governor Walker is making, there's not the structure with open enrollment anymore, the hard deadlines where kids cannot open and roll out any longer. We've seen uh, a change since that change has been made. We've, we're seeing more students open and roll at this point in time later in the year. 20 students at $6,400 a student ends up being approximately $126,000, which is evidenced in line 77 there. So the combination of all those decreases our fund balance by approximately $220,000. Some minor changes in the special projects fund, mostly due to the gift funds, and those funds can carry balances in any given year, carry over mo monies. Fund 27 cannot, but 21 can. So right now, um, for instance, the one of the programs planned a big trip this fall out to New York. So they've been building money in that fund balance in Fund 21, which was accounted for in the student activity accounts in the past. They've been <coughs> saving money, generating money, putting money into that gift account. Now they're starting to buy tickets for that trip. Those monies are being expensed this year, so you're seeing the expenditures in those areas go up as a result of those planned expenditures for that group. Beyond that, there's really no other material changes. One minor change in the food service is a reduction in the revenues anticipated in the food service program due to um, some operational changes there, but nothing else material in any of the other funds. Any other questions on the revisions? Questions? And I would be asking the board for approval on the revisions tonight. 
we right, have to it is on the consent right, agenda. Which has been customary. Mr. Boston. Then human resources employee handbook updates and revisions. Well, Ms. Cates is unable to be with us tonight, so she was going to present, but what I would like to is do, and if need be, if helpful, we, we can uh, try to get these documents up. But what you have tonight is related to the grievance process, and it really is forms that are being placed in the appendix. There's no change to the process. There's no change to the language with our process and that procedure, so I just want to make sure everybody's clear on that. These are simply forms to help, um, and we're putting them specifically in the appendix. We're really trying to streamline, and you've already seen us bring things that we are trying to add to the appendix and trying to help our employees to know where to go uh, and easily find these things. So I know you have some copies there, and um, if it would be helpful, we will try to get those up. Uh, we can but if we can certainly take questions, this would be coming back at the next board meeting for your approval. And I could take you through, again, there's two forms, there's two documents to that. I don't have a question, I just wanna um, spell out a spelling error in the initiation instructions form. Okay, thank you. Keep one copy, it should be, for your records. Say that one more time, please. It should be keep one copy, I believe, under the oh. instructions. Under the instructions Thank you. Portion. The word copy. Got it. Thank you. Any other? I know sometimes you work with these forms and it's hard to see that. So if you see those kind of things, certainly can be helpful. And the, these, I know we do have personnel items under handbook items under the agenda. These are not those items. So, Correct. So if you have any others. Um, feel free to let them know. Okay. Um, then, information technology web vendor host. And I'm going to take that, Ms. Wee is back there running the camera tonight, and so uh, I told her that because of that, I would be happy just to introduce this. And this is something that uh, uh, so much work has gone into. I uh, we're trying to. Um, I guess for multiple years we've been looking and examining our current website. We feel part of our efforts to improve is to look at a different web uh, vendor, web host vendor. And we started the year through a process um, uh, that um, has resulted in a recommendation. Some of the things, though, I just want to make everybody aware. Um, I think there were some uh, well-intended um, outcomes that we had hoped to, uh, for example, um, the cost. And so I want to make sure the board is, is aware that um, the, the work on this, the committee had anticipated the cost. I think, Ms. We would say we currently spend about eighty-five dollars to $8,700 a year. Um, I hope that's, yep, she's nodding on our current and so went into this thinking that it uh, would be under the 10,000 mark related to our board policy. I just need to acknowledge we are not under that. There's also you know, ta um, other issues related to our process that whether or not it applies and again we wanted to be certainly make you aware that the what the committee, the stakeholder committee is recommending is the vendor uh, but resulted in a cost of, of 11,500. The, the uh, committee had um, explored a variety of vendors. There's also the E-rate reimbursement that somewhat uh, directs us as far as the vendors that we work with. So we are recommending and uh, approval and we would actually ask for approval this evening on this because of the time sensitive nature. And I do want to thank uh, Jan and the group of people who uh, worked on this. I also want to thank uh, Jason and Jay for helping clarify some things that um, that perhaps will help us down the road as well as we work through this. So a lot of good effort and I th and I'm pleased with the result and of course we won't truly know until we get it in place and 
And, um, but we would appreciate the board considering action tonight. I know that you haven't had the opportunity for a presentation in advance or a notice, but um, we do have some time sensitive uh, issues to try to meet, especially with our E-rate reimbursement, which we would anticipate would reduce this cost by about 50%. But um, be happy to answer questions. We do know, since, especially since we are asking you to consider approval this evening, and if needed, Jan would step out as well. So are there questions? Okay. And you said the E-rate would reduce this cost to... That would be our hope and expect, and, and really, uh, according to Jan, a pretty good, um, real good possibility of that happening. Yeah. Okay, so seeing no questions, then just be mindful that it is on the um, consent agenda this evening, later this evening. Then board member reports and discussions. I'll call on the board members so they may present any comments or committee reports that they have. Uh, Mrs. Jay Gazinski. Um, other than the Renaissance dinner at Drugan's the other night, which raised, I'm told, a ton of money for Renaissance. Um, what Dale looks like he's going to say something. Go ahead. Dale Go did ahead. dance with me so that I could raise <laughs> tips for my table. My table um, um, all chipped in, and they got others to chip in. So Dale did dance, and I want to commend him for doing that because he was a really good sport about it. Um, so thank you, Dr. Carlson. And um, anyhow, I was told that Renaissance raised um, over $8,000 and the previous high that they had raised ever in all the years that they've done it was about $4,000. So they did just an outstanding, outstanding job. So if any of you have ever wanted to just really have a great time for $30 and some like take 10 $1 bills in your pocket or some $5 bills if you're a big tipper, it is so much fun. And you can be home in your jammies by nine o'clock. It is, <laughs> it is a blast. It's the best entertainment you will ever get. Um, go next year, you can buy tickets for me. And I will dance with whoever tips me the most. So anyhow, that's all I have for board member comments. Thank you, Mrs. Mayor. Um, uh, just a thank you uh, to the administrative staff at the high school. Um, I was able to visit and spend the day with them. I think it was on the 14th or about 10 days ago. And many, many teachers that opened their doors so I could help understand what, what our education looks like. And as always, you know, my socks are knocked off with the quality, the behavior of the kids, and just the treatment. Um, so it was a wonderful day. And mu it's with much, much, much appreciation that you open your doors to us and not just open the doors, but help us and guide us through the day and set that all up. So thank you again very, very much for that. Thank you. Mr. Menninger? Just a couple of quick comments tonight. Uh, I know that uh, spring sports are underway. Track has been indoor, and I believe the first outdoor track meet is scheduled for next Tuesday. I'm looking and seeing heads nod. So uh, signs of spring, and I believe the first baseball game is supposed to be this week, but uh, uh, not sure if that's going to happen or not. We'll uh, see on the weather, but uh, <laughs> there are signs of spring out there. Um, and then the other comment, uh, buildings and grounds met earlier this evening, and for comments on that meeting, I will defer to uh, Ms. Treadway with her report as committee chair. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Menninger. Ms. Treadway. Well, as Tim mentioned, the building and grounds committee met this evening, and um, I want to thank John and Jay for all their work on the um, compiling the unfunded needs as well as this, um, the matrix that we're looking at and the solution suggestions that we've been looking at. So thank you to all your hard work. Um, it was a pleasure to have uh, Lori Kessler and Mary Lynn there tonight to present more of their collaborative community project that they talked with the board about at the last meeting. And it was based on the last board meeting as well as our building and grounds meeting this evening that we'd like to recommend um, to the board that the due to the complex nature of the project that <coughs> the board considers having a district representative on that um, I don't know what group it's called. Jay calls it the CCC group, but happy group, whatever whatever we're calling that group. Um, they had asked for representation from the district and or the board at the last meeting, and so we're recommending that the um, board allows a district representative to attend that and that Dale, Dr. Carlson would be the person to appoint that representative. Um, they were also in favor of having a second representative from the board, 
So if we would like to have an additional board member present at that group, we could do that as well. I don't know if there's any additional thoughts we need to talk about, or um, I assume we'll wait for that until after the April elections. For any yeah, I think, and we had talked before the meeting, I think I was surprised because usually that representative would have been an administrator and they said right to the board. So I think it makes sense to have an administrator there and then board support, it, serve that support role, so yes. Okay, that's it, okay, great. Thank you, um, Mr. Dunlap. I'd like to note we have a set of finance notes in the packet for you to review and uh, also like to let everyone know that the finance committee will not be meeting the next scheduled time. We'll going out three weeks because we've done such a fine job up to this point. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Mr. Gittins. It's always nice to follow Mr. Dunlap because he gets all the work done. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, nothing else to add. Nothing else. All right. Absolutely. Well, um, I just wanted to add, just comment and thank everybody who participated in and was a part of the candidate forum that was held last week. Um, again, I think we always, even though we've done it ourselves, we're always um, surprised when people put their name on that ballot to run and people do it again after they've served on the board. It um, is invaluable service and, and thank you for coming and providing your time and your input so that the community can get a feel for those candidates that we have running for those positions. And thank you for putting your name forward because um, that is the diversity of our board is what makes it strong and I think the district strong as well so so that's really all I have and the League of Women Voters who uh, facilitate that too I wanted to thank them as well so so then moving on to um, correspondence received we did receive a folder that was going through with some information board committee reports buildings and grounds committee notes you received uh, personnel and governance committee notes, finance committee notes, student achievement and learning committee notes were included. And I would note that the board meeting schedule is a special board meeting tomorrow evening. Um, CESA 4 legislative forum at 6.30 on April 4th. We have a board meeting on April 8th. The 18th we have the new member or uh, just uh, school board member orientation for CESA 4. April 26th second a board meeting and May 13th and 27th board meetings um, I would note board evaluation is on here for some discussion and since I am feeling Christina had noted that only two board members had returned those so we maybe are having a little heartburn with um, doing the evaluation so it's a great opportunity I um, am one of the guilty subjects that has not returned mine so it's one of those things you have to sit down and you want to take time to really do it and be thoughtful for it but it is pretty involved and um, that's one of the things I look at it is that it is so involved so um, again just would remind you to get those in as soon as possible just yeah. a good question May 27th is that Memorial Day oh. Just, it is it just a good catch. I wondered it, and then I thought, oh, it wouldn't be on here. <laughs> okay. So, yes, we'll have to look at that, we, yeah. as we always do in May. Just, so, yeah, thank you. Um, then board uh, policy administrative rules for review, youth options, high school credit for courses, and open enrollment. These are rules that will be going to the re respective committees. Um, and... Do you have any comments about any of those? I know we saw a little media recently on the high school credit for courses um, in area school districts. And I think to note that Holman does provide a credit, but it does not go towards their, I think it's a math, usually a math course. So they still have to do the, the credits that are expected, even though they may have that basic one done. And um, So I was reading that very carefully. Any other comments on any of the others? Okay, then um, district administrator's report. In addition to your printed report, um, again, always acknowledging the happenings reports, encourage you to take time with that. It's a nice way for you to stay up and in tune with what's happening in our buildings and departments. But I do want to acknowledge Mr. Saxton, and uh, yes, um, on the personnel report, 
as part of the consent agenda. Mr. Saxton, his resignation slash retirement is in there and uh, 15 years in the school district and I have valued Roger's advice and counsel and expertise from the time that I've been here and he is, um, I, I believe those who have been here for 15 years would, would say our transportation that we provide is in much better uh, shape than what it was 15 years ago. And much of that, not only to our drivers, of course, but that leadership. And so, Roger, thank you, congratulations. And we're gonna try to get still as much out of you in the last weeks and months that we can, so. But, so, <laughs> so uh, thank you, Roger. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge, I was anxious to uh, also recognize uh, some of the activities that I've had the opportunity to most recently attend. The calendar is packed full of things, but I tell you, last week was uh, another example, a highlight. Uh, in the same day, in fact, I was able to go from the inaugural Iron Chef competition at the high school and then move right out to the Renaissance, uh, the celebrity dinner um, at Drugan's. And it was, just, uh, it was just a great day and just an example of a number of those that we have. So congratulations to Mr. Gasper and everybody involved with the Iron Chef and then as well as our celebrity dinner. And uh, just a couple, a couple highlights of many uh, that occurred. Um, and yes, I was gonna note the board meeting May 27th. I did in my Friday report that calendar, I put a tentative as far as Tuesday the 28th. Uh, the board can consider that it does, uh, that is what we did I think, I think just a year ago. I believe we had the same conflict and we met on the board, decided to have that uh, rescheduled meeting on Tuesday the 28th. So it'll be something that we'll need to know from you specifically and, and, um, and Cheryl, you can mm -hmm. you know, help me and you can pretty much right. say that that's when we're gonna do it and so. So we're gonna meet on the 28th. <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> uh, other than that, unless you have questions, I think I have everything covered. <clears throat> Thank you. Any comments or questions? I just would note, I did look at that, the police liaison report, and I liked that it was spelled out some of those classes that they'd visited and what the purpose of mm -hmm. that meeting was, and that's just nice because I think my emphasis and focus is that, and a lot of the other incident reports, yeah, those things are important to have that support too, but it's really getting in the classroom and working with those young people is, uh, I think really important. So. And such a willingness, a credit to Officer Hickey about um, wanting, wanting to provide uh, that record and, and that information for you and it's something that's a little different and, and uh, we would appreciate your ongoing feedback on that mm -hmm. and as we try to explore a little bit more of a description but of course can't describe too much. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's some limitation there too but and he really is um, trying to emphasize too being that uh, as far as that educational component so any uh, feedback would be appreciated okay then moving on to the consent agenda item so we have a number of items this evening and I would entertain a motion to approve them unless there are any that you would like to have pulled out to be considered separately so second so Kari moved to accept or to approve the consent agenda items and it was seconded. Any discussion on any of those? Obviously with regret, the personnel report, but um, also with um, a congratulations as well. So, okay, so motion has been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda items as presented. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Nay. Motion passes, executive session, Mrs. Treadway. <laughs> I move that the Board of Education moves to executive session as per Wisconsin Statute 19.851C for the purpose of reviewing the potential non-renewal of an employee contract and for the purpose of considering employment options for transportation supervisors. Is there a second? Second. And do the roll call vote, please. Cheryl Hancock? Yes. Nina Jaginski? Yes. Kate Mayer? Yes. Tim Menninger? Yes. Myself? Yes. Gary Dunlop? Yes. Joe Gittins? Yes. 
Okay, we will reconvene in five minutes.